praise the Lord. We're going to start in Luke chapter 4. We've been doing a series on what, how does God see the church? What is his concept of what the body of Christ on earth should look like? And we're going to start in Luke chapter 4, verse 36. We're tapping in here on Jesus' earthly ministry. And amazement came upon them all, and they began talking with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands his unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him was spreading into every locality in the surrounding district. Now, look at verse 36. What was the hallmark, the distinguishing factor and characteristic of Jesus' ministry? What is this message for with authority and power? Everybody say authority and power. Authority. He had authority and power everywhere he went, and the Bible says he gave us that authority and power. Verse 38. Then he got up and left the synagogue, entered Simon's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him to help her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever and it left her, and she immediately got up and waited on them. A couple of questions. Did the Lord Jesus Christ heal huge crowds or individually in private homes? Yes. Oh, yes, that's the answer. Yes. There were, were there a lot of strings attached? Like you have to come in a crowd or you have to be sick at home. No, he, you know why he doesn't put strings up? He loves to heal. It's his heart to heal. It's his heart to heal you more than it's your heart to receive. You say, well, why am not all, I don't always heal then? Because we haven't always learned to receive. But his heart is always to heal. Verse 40. While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. A uh, real quick question. Think about this. Was there any disease that successfully challenged the Lord Jesus Christ's power and authority? Not one. Would the coronavirus challenge his authority if he was here today? Is he here today? Yeah. Okay. Wow. You guys are sharp. Now we're early and sharp. Verse 42. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place. And the crowds were searching for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away. They wanted him all to themselves, didn't they? Yep. In verse 43, but he said to them, I must preach the kingdom above the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now, was Jesus a preacher? Yeah, before he was a healer, he was a preacher. It says everywhere he, he preached and then he healed. Um, what was the subject of his message? We need verse 43 for that, I think. What was the subject of Jesus' message? I must preach... The kingdom of God. How many sermons growing up did you hear on the kingdom of God? Maybe you did, but I never heard anything about the kingdom of God. Now, it's interesting because we, uh, we're, we, everybody believes in preaching being born again, and we do too. But Jesus mentioned being born again one time in all scripture. He talked to Nicodemus, one person, and explained the way into the kingdom. But he constantly talked about the kingdom. We'll get to that later. What does it mean to preach the kingdom of God? Now listen to this. It means that he announced the arrival of a whole other realm that anybody could step into if they'd make Jesus their Lord. The way that you step into the king is to make him your king. Yeah. The, the kingdom is what the king reigns over. Yeah. If your heart, in your heart, Jesus is Lord, that means your heart is part of the kingdom of God. Amen. Yeah. Pretty simple, but it's true. And there is a manifestation of the kingdom that's still way ahead. It says in Revelation, the kingdom's of this of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever. That's the open manifestation when the whole world sees it. I don't care how evil they've been, everybody will see Jesus Christ in his glory. That's the complete manifestation of the kingdom. But that's the second coming. Just as there's a second coming of Christ, there was the first coming of the kingdom. Jesus said in Luke 17, the kingdom is within you. The moment you get born again, your heart becomes part of the kingdom of God. Now, if we're here in Luke 4. Let's look at Luke 8. I just want you, I didn't pick and choose to find, you don't have to pick and choose to find scriptures about the kingdom. You have to studiously avoid them, not to preach about them. The whole New Testament is about the arrival of the kingdom of God on earth. Why, why did it have to arrive? Because he got kicked out of the garden. The garden in the beginning was part of the kingdom, right? All right, Luke, 1, Luke 8, verse 1. Soon afterwards, he began going around from one city to and village to another proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. 
So that would be like him going to Richmond and Montrose and Bowling Green, big cities, little towns in between, proclaiming and preaching the arrival of one thing, God's kingdom. Now, if you just keep going here, Luke 9, the first two verses, and you say, where are you going with this? I'm going to try to, to show you today that the main reason we don't see more people with healing ministries and just naturally healing is because we don't have a kingdom mindset. The power of just thinking at, like the king thinks, a, thing, a kingdom mindset. We'll get there in a minute. Luke 9, this is when he first sent the twelve out on their own. And he called the twelve together, and he gave them power and authority. Pause, can he do that? Yes. Yeah. Does he have the power and authority? Yes. Could he give it to them? Yes. Could he give it to us? Yes. Did he? Yes. yes. He gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim what? The kingdom of God and to perform healing. He sent them to proclaim the supernatural superior kingdom of God that was at hand. Now what does that mean to be at hand? So close they could reach out and grab it if they so desired and so chose. Now, if you ask, I've said this already, I'm going to say it again. If you ask a lot of folks, what should our primary message be? It's the new birth. You must be born again. I agree. I'm glad for every church this morning that's pre preaching people to be born again. But I grew up in a church that preached the new birth, got me born again, and set me right down inside the door of the kingdom and said everything else is for later. Right. I never grew up at all. And that wasn't their fault. They hadn't grown up at all because nobody told them. But if you study the, t the, the Gospels, the, the door into the kingdom, the new birth, is simply that, the door, and then comes the rest of life. The good news is that the message of the kingdom of God is, includes a new birth, but is much bigger. Now, how many of you have ever met people who really were born again, but were still nasty? Okay, that's because they're babies. They just got barely inside the kingdom door, and nobody ever got their mind renewed to the love of God. That, yeah. Oh, got real quiet in here when you say that word, nasty. I mean, none of us are nasty all the time. It's just once. Okay. <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> now, listen, what we're talking about today is liberating. Because last week we were talking about everybody's supposed to have a healing ministry. That does not mean you have to go rent an auditorium. It doesn't mean you have to buy a sound system or a microphone, but it does mean that when your co-worker's hurting and you know they're suffering, and you know that the healing power of God is available, you can offer to pray for them. That's what that means, all right? The new birth is a one-time, life-transforming experience that happens on one day. It is the only method provided by the Word of God to enter the kingdom. If you look at um, John 3, 5, Jesus said it here. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then verse 7, he says, Don't be amazed, Nicodemus, that I tell you, you must be born again. So if I ask you how many of you have been born again, just about everybody here, I think, probably has been born again. But the message of the kingdom, it includes the new birth experience, but it is a life-transforming experience that affects every moment of every day of the rest of your eternity. All right, three million years from now, we're going to be operating in the kingdom of God. You're still going to meet my sister, Rachel, and we're still going to be walking in the love of God. And you say, do you think heaven will be boring? I don't see how heaven could be boring, because God is never boring. He's just never boring. We don't know what it, all he'll be up to, but he'll be up to something. The king is in our midst with his love and healing power. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, don't be amazed that you have to be born again. Sin has affected everything about you down to your spiritual DNA. You're not fit for the kingdom the way you are, Nicodemus. You've got to get refathered inside and get some new DNA. Now, Colossians, this is a little bit of really brief review for a lot of you, but Colossians 1, 13 to 14 says we were radically reborn. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's why they were announcing the kingdom in whom we have forgiveness, the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So the reason that John the Baptist preached everywhere the kingdom of, his, of God is at hand, why didn't Isaiah preach the kingdom of God is at hand? Because it wasn't at hand. What did Isaiah live? 600 years before Christ? Okay. When John came, they were just right on that edge of history between the two covenants, and he says, you're so close that pretty soon you're going to reach out and grab the kingdom of God. You're going to get born again. Hallelujah. Amen. We were radically reborn, refathered, and popped down into the kingdom of love and life and shalom. Your spirit is good with God. Amen. He gave you a new spirit. 
The no. problem is your body will still do anything you let your body do. It, yeah. You can go home and eat a dozen donuts. I would, but if I let my body out, it'd be more than I like donuts. It's been so long since I had a donuts okay. But your body never gets saved. It will do whatever you permit it to do. But you are not your body. Do we have the chart, Phil? Yep. You are not your body. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be redeemed. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit is not the middle because it's the smallest, but because it's the hidden part of you. It's the real part of you. Most of us, unfortunately, live a whole lot in our heads. Okay? It's like Nathan was saying, that these really smart intellectual kids had trouble just jumping into faith because their heads, you know, you use your head a lot. If you're going to have a healing ministry and be happy about it, comfortable about it, you got to learn to live out of your heart. Your heart is good with God. And your heart has been reborn and is righteous. Now we're looking at the body. You know, your body, could, there's practically no sin out there your body wouldn't do if you let it. So you're not going to let it, right? Okay? Your body's like a pet. You tame your pet, you know? All right. You don't, and you get to heaven, you get a new one, and sin won't be an issue. Glory to God. So... The real you, your spirit, has to de determine that you will live holy. Now look at verse 2, back, back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. I know you know this verse, but I really want you to think about it today. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Right away, the Apostle Paul says, if you want to demonstrate in your life what the will of God looks like, you're going to have to get your head renewed to the kingdom of God and not to this world. You have to redo your thoughts and embrace a kingdom mindset. Now, a lot of times, that's about walking in love. A kingdom mindset means they just think mercy. How many people do you know they think mercy before they think Arr, irritation? You know what I mean? But that's the difference. Jesus was merciful. Okay, so we know that a kingdom mindset includes walking in love, being walking in integrity, and being kind, but it also includes the reality of the supernatural around us being available. You see, your whole life, Jesus' whole life was a bridge, heaven to earth. In John chapter 1, he said, I, I see angels, you will see angels ascending and descending on the, on the Son of Man. You know? You know why? Because his life, you say, how, how was his life a bridge? His heart was like a portal where God came through. Yeah. Now you see, some of these... Um, Oh, I don't want to say witches, but some of the people who access dark forces, they use channeling and things like that that are nothing more than a wretched, wretched counterfeit of what mankind was meant to be. Adam was just meant to be the open door between God and earth. He was to bring the blessing of God to earth because his heart was open to God. Right now, I'm supposed to be an open door for God to use to bless your life with teaching and light. But uh, the only way I'm going to get that is if my heart is right with God. You see? The other thing is I can't be up here completely living out of my own head because my head ain't that smart. I don't care how, how good I look on paper with brains compared to the Holy Spirit within me. My head is not that smart. Yeah. All right, so I want us to look at Mark chapter 16. We talked about what the church of Jesus Christ, when, when the Lord envisioned the church, he did not see a whole bunch of people going to church sick and going home sick. I'm not saying you are sick, but I'm just saying if you are, God's best is for you to leave your healed. He loves to heal. Now, this is when the Lord sent out his church the first time, so... Anything you don't like, you talk to him about this, all right? <laughs> Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he was risen. Wouldn't that be hard? The first time you see Jesus after he rose from the dead, he has to rebuke you. Mary saw him. Mary went back and told them, and they said it didn't even make sense to them. Now, you know, we choose between faith and, and unbelief. And, you know, we, it's possible. I think, I think that if the Lord Jesus came in person and talked to the church in America, he would rebuke us for our hardness of heart. And they say that's hard, but listen, do you know, how many know who Reinhard Bonnke was? Magnificent evangelist of Africa. Saw 
literally three and four million people at a time come to his meetings, documented a million people. They got cards on a million people to get them into churches. I mean, this man saw people raised from the dead. He saw, he saw many, many healings. And this is what they, he answered. They said, why is it so much harder to get a miracle in the United... Yeah, first they said, is it harder to get a miracle in the United States of America than it is in Africa? And he said, absolutely. And they said, why? Have you seen miracles? Yes, he said, I've seen miracles here, but it's a lot harder. And they said, why? And they said, because you are embalmed in unbelief. The Western mind has been in, embalmed with sort of a cynicism, a cynical unbelief. And we don't mean to be. It's not condemnation. But I just think that if, if you go back, like what Nathan was talking about this morning with the kids that, you know, I haven't figured that all out. You're not going to figure it out. You're going to figure anything out. We had a girl healed of cystic fibrosis. She's in Guam right now. They went back for a visit. But she was healed. You don't get healed of cystic fibrosis. There's no cure. And do you know how long her parents came before they got healed? Six weeks. And they came, and we were teaching the Word. Just giving them the Word. The Word will, itself will heal. Ben nodded. The father grabbed it, believed it, and he walked into their next doctor's appointment, and the doctor sat him down and said, uh, Mr. Albert, I don't know how to tell you this. And Ben's heart sank. He thought she was going to say she's dying. Because they had moved here, relocated. He's in the Navy. They got transferred here from Guam because they did not have adequate medical facilities there to take care of Izzy. And he kept saying, I don't know how to tell you this. And, doc, and he said, well, doctor, just say it. He said, we can't find any cystic fibrosis in your and your daughter's body. And you say, and you say, well, how did that happen? It didn't happen because I'm that spiritual. It happened because the Word of God is true. Jesus Christ paid for our sicknesses and diseases. Next week, we're going to go through a theological, you know, this is Lent. We're going to look at theologically, what did he do in, rea in reality? What did he do? He paid for your emotional distresses in the Garden of Gethsemane. At the whipping post, he paid for your sicknesses to be healed. And on the cross, he paid for your sins to be forgiven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Romans, or, or we want to look at Mark 16. So, where in verse 14, he has rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. And then he told them, aren't you glad he didn't throw them out over it? Glory. He say, glory, there's forgiveness for unbelief and hardness of heart, right? 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. He who has believed and been baptized shall be saved. He who has disbelieved will be condemned. Then verse 17 says, these signs will accompany those who have believed. It doesn't say these signs will accompany every evangelist as great as Billy Graham or as great. It doesn't say that. It says these signs will accompany people with microphones. No. no. These signs will accompany believers. Yeah. I don't care what your occupation is. If you're a believer, you should see how signs and wonders accompany you because that's what God, the Lord said. Amen. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. Now, you don't go looking for demons. But whether a person is manifesting a demon or whether a situation is manifesting a demon, if, if there is a situation and you know things don't make sense, something's really swirling here, you don't have to do it in front of everybody. Get in your prayer closet and say, you foul spirit of division or whatever it is, I break your power and you will see things change. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. And you say, why? That's one of those things when, where the Father ordained it. And I... We, there's many, many instances where spray, speaking in tongues has been documented to be a human language and been translated, known, and recognized. Usually it's an angelic language that the devil doesn't know. All right? But it says, okay, did it or did it not say they will speak in tongues? Yes, they will. They will pick up serpents. Now, we talked about this last week. How do Christians pick up serpents? Everybody said accidentally. You don't go around trying to pick up a serpent. But like when Paul was building the fire in Malta, it was cold and rainy and a serpent attached. And they all thought, oh, he's a murderer, right? Remember when we read that? Yeah. And then five minutes later, he's out there. They said, oh, he's a god. And they started worshiping him. That's how much people know. So <laughs> always remember, next time people think you're great, they may not like you in five minutes. So don't let it get to you. Okay. So how do you, you know what the Bible says? It's in Acts 28. We read it last week. He said he shook it off. If you accidentally get bit by a snake, go to a doctor, but take dominion over the venom. You have that, all right? You yeah. shook it off. And if they accidentally drink poison, that's how that would happen, it wouldn't hurt them. Now look at the last line. Read, read it with me. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, how does this work? It says that 
let's keep reading here. They, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Just real quick. I know we're hitting a lot of practical things here. We love instant healings, and we've seen a lot of them. But it doesn't say they'll always be instantly healed. It does say from that moment on, they will get better. Yeah. Okay? That'll set you free. Verse 19. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So where's Jesus? The right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord... Hmm. The Lord usually refers to Jesus. So where's Jesus? He's at the right hand of God and he's in you. By your spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of Jesus. Okay? So look what happens. They went out and preached everywhere while the Lord were with them and confirmed the word by signs following. Now, if the word is not confirmed by signs following, we're even not telling the whole truth or something's up. Yeah. If you have an ulterior motive, you're preaching the word, but you have a money motive, you might not have signs following. Or if you don't really understand what you're saying, you might have. But if you understand the word of God, there should always be signs following that word. That's what he confirmed what he spoke. This is the Christianity right there where it says they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord worked with them. And he confirmed the word. That's the Christianity that turned the world upside down. Right. You go to Europe, like I just said, you're in England. Two to three hundred years after Christ, it's all evangelized. Those huge, huge, mon not monasteries, but um, abbeys and stuff in England were built. And I think, how in the world could the gospel have gone that fast? It was propelled forward by the supernatural. Now, last week I talked to you about the fact that God wants you to have a healing ministry. And I could see some of your minds were reeling. But I want you to look at a scripture, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Where I could think, my goodness, I don't need one more thing. I have all this stuff to do and now I've got to have a healing ministry. I want to talk to you about a, a kingdom mindset and how it will free up your time and free up the stress in your life. God... Mm, let me, let me read this to you before, and I'll probably, probably read it again afterwards. When Jesus sent you to preach the gospel to the ends of the world, if you have a kingdom mindset, it's like Christiana said, there'll be plenty of finances. There'll be plenty of healing power. This is the way a, a, a kingdom-minded person thinks this. Remember, we, we saw, do not be conformed to this world's thinking. What does this world think? It thinks lack. It thinks stress. It thinks division, it thinks divorce, broken relationships, lack, stress. I mean, this is just this constant. The kingdom minded, the heavenly minded person says, there's plenty of money for everything I'm called to do. If I'm called to do it, the money will be there. Yeah. There's plenty of healing power available from heaven. Our father is too good to ever ask me to do anything I couldn't do. We're in this as a team. Every day is a day of my being right with him and him being right with me. It's a day of righteousness and peace and joy, right? This yeah. is a kingdom mindset. The kingdom thinker thinks there's plenty of mercy. The kingdom thinker, instead of looking at every crazy quality your uh, co-worker has or somebody you know has, all you see is reconciliation. You have reconciliation on your heart if you're a kingdom thinker because God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, just to put your minds at ease that we're not supposed to be stressed over this, I wanted to read from the message translation a familiar scripture. The Lord says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burnt out with religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know that you can go through the whole New Testament and I can't find one place Jesus was in a hurry? <laughs> Jesus believed there was enough time. <coughs> Isn't that crazy? He actually believed there was enough time. Wow. I said, if I, if I think about this long enough, it's going to set me free. Because I'm always yeah. in a hurry. I never mean to hang up in you. I'm just in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. Learn, everybody say that. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Say it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And then we keep reading with me. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and quietly. That means I won't put anything heavy on you. When I ask you to pray for the sick, I'm not doing it to where I put something heavy on you. Guess what? You don't have to heal them. Everybody say, thank God, I don't have to heal them. Thank God. Hallelujah. Now, 
you don't have to go around an auditorium to have healing ministry, but you do have to think so much like heaven that you have great compassion for people. You're not willing to see them quit hurting or keep hurting. Well, like I said, let me give you a brief thing. We're going to be done a little bit early and just pray for each other again. Do you know that sometimes you live with stuff in your body just because you can live with it? You don't even go to a doctor. I can live with it. But you know what? Jesus' best is for us to be free. Free in our emotions, free in our minds, free in our bodies. I'm going to read this part again. When Jesus told you to go preach the gospel, it should be a given that the money will be there. And you say, how can it be a given? Um, let, let me explain. The reason I rejoice when Christiana prayed with this lady who's pastor in church to receive the baptism is because the baptism of the Holy Spirit totally transformed my life. It went from having this much of God to this much of God, more of God than I need, all right? When you get overflowing. When I first started pastoring the church because my husband had passed away, one of the greatest intimidations that I faced was praying with people to receive the baptism because to me that was a huge thing. It didn't change anything. So, okay. All right. So every time a special speaker came, I had my little group that I thought was ready to pray for them. And then somebody get, you know, Richard Burke, somebody would get filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank God. <laughs> Finally, I realized I'm going to have to get my nerve up and try to pray for somebody. And after a while, like two out of three were getting filled. Right now, if you come up here and you want to baptize the Holy Spirit, it's not me. But I had to step out when it was scary. Yeah. And when I didn't feel comfortable, and when I didn't think I had the faith, I had to step out and start praying for people. Yeah. And that's the way it is with healing. <laughs> you know, what if only one out of the first two get healed that you pray for? Well, that's one person that doesn't have to sit in a doctor's office hurting and trying to figure out how many needles they got to take. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You, you never know whether Jesus actually meant what he said. You realize none of us put any of these words in it. These are the words of Jesus Christ. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Right. All right, so let me, I'm going to reread this one more time. If you have a kingdom mindset and he tells you to go on a mission trip, there will be plenty of finances. And you say, don't you worry about that? I never worried about Christiana. It ha because when she said, Carlos and Cindy need me down there, I just felt this burst of joy. I knew it had to be God. And I knew, I said, the, fun, the funds will be there. You know, that yeah, you'll... Yeah. And, and you say, did you know that the first time you needed funds? No, but if you walk with somebody, all right, you may be here as a guest. I would absolutely positively know what you're going to do tomorrow because we don't know each other and you don't know what I'm going to do. But if Bill and Karen Thompson, Randy and Sherry Dean tell me they're going to do something, let me tell you something. They've been with uh, Danny and John back there. They've been with us since before Gordon died. They believed in this church even through the great transition of leadership and building two buildings and everything. I know what they will do. For me to say, I don't know, Bill will keep his word, would be the greatest insult I could have. When I first started trusting God for finances, wow, I mean, it was huge because Gordon just died. We got this old 7-Eleven we thought we could fix up for a few thousand bucks. My goodness, that thing was a total, oh my goodness. It took us six weeks just to gut the place. We had to take out the family, then we had to get the rock lab, and then we had to get the insulation, and then we had to get back to the mold. And then we had to spray all the cement block down. This was an old highest building or like a 7-Eleven. Yep. We needed money that wasn't there. Yeah. The, the, the owners that sold it to us, they promised to fix the roof. They put a band-aid on the roof. We still had a leaky roof. So I went to the roofer they employed. And they said, I'm sorry, lady. I did everything legally I was responsible for and paid to do. He called me back the next day. And he said, this is his exact words. You know, God sure must love you. And I said, oh, yeah. He said, I'm Catholic, and God doesn't talk to Catholics. Now, I, didn't, I don't believe that. I don't love him. All right, so if you're Catholic, I didn't say God doesn't talk to He said, I'm Catholic. God doesn't talk to Catholics. I got, up this, I got up this morning, and the Lord said, you know what it would take to fix it, right? Send her $2,000 and have that roof fixed. He says, hey, there's a check on the way. God sure must love you. Well, let me tell you something. At a point in my life, when I was hurting worse than I knew a human could hurt, losing a spouse is the worst thing I've ever been through in my life. It's just, it's like part of you dies, and you can't get rid of that pain. Knowing that God Almighty loved me enough to talk to a Catholic. Come on. <laughs> somebody that evidently wasn't in. Uh, this is, I watched us have the money when we had no money. We, we, when Gordon died, we had $37,000. It took twenty five for down, down payment. We had $12,000 when we needed fifty, And we were just a handful of people. Yeah. And miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. When we got in this church, God sent somebody from Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
to help us film it. So nice. It was amazing. It was a total miracle. He's well known in Word of Faith circles. Everybody that I know knows him. Said, how did you make that happen? I said, I did it. But it took a lot more money to get into this building than the people in that part of the building had. And yet God gave and gave and gave. And so when Christiana gets a call, I'm just trying to make a point here. But Christiana gets a call that she's needed an herb light, and an herb light plane ticket is expensive. It's like down at the bottom of the earth. <laughs> not a problem. And you say, why is it not a problem? Because I've walked with this guy. Yeah. I've walked with him, and he's so faithful. Yeah. Now, same with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you want to get filled with the Spirit, I always say it takes five minutes. Adele corrected me. She said, it went 30 seconds. Back. You know it went. And it's true. You just pray and God fills people with the Holy Spirit. You have to gain that confidence. That's what I tried to communicate to Jose when he this WhatsApp thing the other night. He was so excited. I said, Pastor, you're going to find it easier and easier and easier and easier to get people filled. Because after a while, there's just no fear left. Yeah. Now, we're talking about you praying for the sick. The first time you pray for the sick, you will have to overcome a bit of hesitation. Because the enemy, the last thing in the world he wants is to, for you. It, I don't care, Michael, if you're driving a truck. He wants you to pray for the truckers. Yeah. There's truckers who get backaches. You know that? I'm, I'm picking on somebody, I know. But I'm telling everybody here knows somebody that needs to know that the living God is real. Yeah. And the only way they know is to see signs and wonders. So you need to know, for to have a kingdom mindset, you know there's going to be plenty of money if he sends you. There's going to be plenty of healing power available. There never was a day where Jesus got to the last ten people and said, I'm sorry, have it just read up. <laughs> And you say, you're being silly. Well, aren't you being silly? Do you think there's a limit on the power that you can draw from heaven? Hallelujah. The Lord never asks you to heal anyone. We pray and release his healing power. You lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We are to focus on the rest that comes from being 100% right with him. Where our days are his. And, you know, you don't, I don't go around just knocking everybody over and come all praying for everybody. I wish I was more trigger happy. I think God wants us more trigger. But at the same time, when you get prompted to pray for somebody, especially if it's somebody that loves and trusts you, you should go right ahead and do it. Um, I was going to spend a few minutes on the laying of, on of hands. How many of you grew up in a denomination where you never saw anybody lay hands on anybody? The only time I ever saw it was when we sent, we ordained people. Right. Can I show? I think I better take the time because if, if this is not born out in the Word of God, you definitely shouldn't listen to me. But if it's in the Word, then we've just been underinformed. Yeah. We weren't totally misinformed. We got informed about the new birth. The first two verses of Hebrews chapter 6 give you five doctrines, basic doctrines of the church. Okay, the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation. And it's going to give you five basic doctrines that are the foundation of the church. A foundation of repentance from dead works. How many of you grew up, you believed in repentance? Okay, even if you didn't believe in laying on hands, you believed in repentance. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from good works and of faith toward God. How many of you told that by faith you're going to get saved by faith? You believed in faith, you believed in repentance. Okay, let's keep going. Next verse. Of instruction about washings. If we could read this, almost every other translation says baptism. Do we have that in the New King James? The New King James says of instruction about baptisms. How many believe in, in baptism in water at the denomination you were raised in? We believe, okay, we believe in faith. We believe in repentance. We believe in baptisms. If we, in a minute, we'll get the translation that says baptism. Lay on the hands. Ah, oh, we put that out. And then the resurrection of the dead. How many of you believe in the resurrection of the dead? You believe that your body will be raised. Okay. How many of you believe in eternal judgment? That Hitler's not going to get away scot free? Okay, there's eternal judgment. There's six things here, five of them. I don't care if you were raised Baptist or Catholic. I don't care what you were raised. Five of them, you say, absolutely, I hold to that. I hold to repentance. I hold to eternal judgment. Right in the middle of the six is laying on hands. Jesus taught the laying on hands. Jesus laid hands on folks. And he said, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, I'm going to show you what happens when... A believer lays hands on another believer. Nathan, come on. I, I forgot to talk to you about this. Who wants to be the person? Jesse, come on. You're going to be the person that's sick. So Jesse comes up. You got any problems? Not right now? Okay, we're going to just say you have problems with your knees then. Okay? So he's come up and he wants healing. The Bible says that I'm a believer and I lay hands on the sick. So as I lay my hands 
on Jesse's head. This is what Jesus does. Jesus is with me all the time. Come and step right up here. Jesus puts one hand there and one hand on my other hand. Yeah? You're my son. It's okay. All right. <laughs> and this is how I lay hands on the sick. Yeah. And you say, we can't see Jesus. Neither can I, and I could care less. Show them one more time. When I lay hands on the sick, or when you lay hands on the sick, yeah. This is what's happening. Yeah. So you see, it's not a stretch. If you use, now let's suppose that Jesus were here and we had the big white, your beautiful Jesus costume though, and we had it on Nathan, <laughs> and he laid hands, no laid hands on him. You have no problem in this world knowing that if Jesus is here in the flesh, in all his glory, and his beautiful white robe, and says, Jesse, by my stripes you're healed, he is going to be healed. The only difference is, since he's not here in the flesh, he thought he'd use three, uh, two or three billion Christians, or how many billion Christians are, and he said, okay, now show them how. Jesse, I'm your pastor. I'm going to lay hands on you. God bless you, and heal him, and I pray, Lord, thank you. Let your power flow. And this is how he supports you. Thank you very much. You were a help. Yeah. Hallelujah. Here's, here's where our problems. Our minds like to be in charge. You're, it's just like Nate. I, I'm glad Nathan used that it, it, that illustration. It's so perfect what we're talking about today. Because I love those kids, brilliant, brilliant kids that had the highest scholarship or Roberts University award. They're smart, but the problem when you're smart is your head wants to be in charge. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, the only way the Lord got to me, I was so desperate emotionally and so much needed God. I was 19 years old. I just told my head to shut up. And we'll see what happens. And then after a few minutes later, I was so happy and praying in tongues. And he says, he, or my mind, whatever my mind is. My mind says, you don't know what you're saying. And I thought, I don't care. I don't care. God knows. The Bible says in Romans 8, 26, that the Spirit intercedes for us with groaning, shooting for words. He prays the perfect will of God. Would you go to that, Phil? It's Romans 8, 26 and 28. And you say, why didn't my church? I don't know. My whole life experience was in an evangelical church where we got born again, plopped right inside the door of the kingdom and left there. And never grow up. Never. Okay. In the same way. Read this with me. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. Pause. Who is the Spirit? Say the Holy Spirit. Okay. Read it with me. For we do not know how to pray as we should. Pause. That is the biggest clue in the Bible about why he came up with speaking in tongues. <laughs> and it's the greatest freebie I've ever had. You don't know how to pray more than two or three sentences about any problem. You leave, we leave 98% of it unprayed here on earth. And you say, why is this such a big deal? Because the people on earth are the people with the authority. Why do we pray for the coronavirus to stop? We are on earth. We have the authority. Yeah. The biggest reason that you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit is because you don't know how to pray with power. Once they got the power, once they received the baptism, they could pray in other tongues. And yes, many times it's been documented. Joel Osteen's father, John Osteen, was flying with a Catholic priest once. And he said, can I pray for you? Because they had good fellowship. And he said, certainly. And he told him what to pray for. He began by praying in other tongues. And the guy's weeping when he opens his eyes. And he prayed in other tongues. And he prayed in English. And he said, why are you crying, my brother? He said, do you know what language you were speaking? Do you speak that dialect of a Mandarin or whatever it was? And John says, no, I don't even know speak English, do it. And, and he says, you were speaking my language perfectly, and you were praying the blessing of God. This has been documented many, many times, that it is often a, a human natural language. Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. You really don't want your other tongue to be a tongue of men all the time. I don't want to pray in French because the devil understands French and Swahili and Portuguese. But he doesn't understand codes. My husband, in way back in the late in the 70s, was a, um, what do you call that? Cryptograph. Crypto guy. Yeah, he called himself the crypto man. And he had to fix crypto boxes. He didn't know how they worked exactly. He didn't know how to fix them. And he said, I'll tell you what. I fought God and fought God and fought God when he was 25 years old in the, in the Air Force. He surrendered to God. And the people that he had been having a Bible study with were Pentecostals. And he knew they prayed in other tongues. And he said, the reason praying in other tongues made such perfect sense to me is we could bombard the whole earth <coughs> with our next battle plan. And they didn't have a clue because they couldn't break the code. 
that makes perfect sense for me. Did God to give me a language to pray out? Because it look at what it says. In the same way, the Spirit also knows our weakness. What is our weakness? We don't know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because. What does he intercede for? He intercedes for you according to the perfect will of God. If you need to pray for your life according to the perfect will of God and you don't know what the plan is, pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. He knows the whole plan. And the beautiful part is Satan can't say, oh, I know the plan, I'll go up there and stop it. He hasn't got a clue. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah, that's good. Amen. Now laying on of hands. Laying on of hands simply means it's just like if... Um, you left your lights on. Most of our vehicles won't do that anymore. Isn't that nice? But suppose you left your lights on, you go out, and your battery's dead. Somebody in here's got jumper cables. Probably a lot of these guys have jumper cables. And in, in five minutes, they'll have you going again because you just take the jumper from one battery and jump to the next. When we lay hands, there isn't a disease on earth that you can't get healed of without having hands laid on you. Mm -hmm. Come on. It's just one of the ways to get healed. Yeah. But the beautiful part is that... When somebody lays hands on you, they're giving you a job. Yeah. I can come in here and be really, really calm <coughs> and tell somebody, would you pray for me? I just need a job. And they can lay hands on me. <laughs> okay? So you can get the hands lit on for a couple of reasons. And I know we've only got like five minutes. I'm trying to make this practical and doable today. Any problem we have with the healing ministry is right between our ears. We just yeah. don't know. Okay? You can get hands laid on you for healing. And the healing power flows. You can get hands laid on you to receive the baptism. If you look in the in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, there's only two places where people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit without others laying hands. The first is 120 on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, God just says the Holy Spirit invaded the place from heaven. Who was going to lay hands on them? There wasn't a spirit-filled believer on the planet, right? right. The other place, and I think this is so cool, in Acts chapter 10, when the... When the um, Gentiles first got filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter didn't even think he should be there. First words we talked about this the other night. First words out of his mouth, I really shouldn't be here. Even though God had told him to go. He's not really shouldn't be here. I'm a Jew. He didn't think these Gentiles can get saved. Right. But God told him to share. So he's saying, you know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit after he's preaching. All of a sudden the Holy Ghost just fell on the whole group. Why? Because there's no way Peter would lay hands on them. Right. Peter didn't think they could be saved. And he said, well, they knew. He said, well, you got to be able to baptize them in water if God's already baptizing the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So laying on the hands is an important concept. So, I mean, I'm just going to read to the end and skip a little bit here. To have a kingdom mindset. Okay. I keep backing up one more step. We'll never get there. <laughs> I got saved at six. And I really was saved. I do believe I was saved. Because if I ever went to tell a wife from then on, God had taken me down back to that altar and said, hey, we made a deal. I didn't know the word covenant. If he had said, we made a covenant, I wouldn't always talk back. He said, we made a deal. I knew we were saved. Oh, I can't tell a lie. Okay. So I was saved at six. But from the time I was six until the time I was 19, I truly believed in God, but it wasn't very real to me. If you asked me, are you, are you sure you're saved? I would say, no, I think I'm saved. I was sure I was saved, but then I got filled with the Spirit. And you say, why is that? Because... When you are born again, you are born of the Spirit, and you absolutely get a measure of the same Holy Spirit that we're talking about. You have a measure of the Spirit. These people who went into the upper room, the 120, they had been born again. And in Luke chapter 24, he says, receive the, whole, the Spirit. And they received a measure of the Spirit. They were born again. But in Acts chapter 2, he flooded them. In every single gospel, John the Baptist said, I baptize you in water. But there's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. It's an absolute second experience. It changed my life so much. So my first point here, if you want to be kingdom-minded, you have to know that God is guiding you and intimately involved in your everyday life. You know, you look back and you say, oh, that was God. you got to... For, to be, have a kingdom mindset where you're just ready to heal, you know, heal people or pray for people at any time, you got to be aware of God's presence. And I say that with this little caveat... I personally never knew the presence of God like I know His presence right now until I got filled with the Spirit. I urge you to just receive. You say, what if I get something else? No, he said, I will. If you ask your daddy for a loaf of bread, I'm not going to give you a stone. If you ask him for a fish, he's not going to give you anything but the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's too good for that. All right.
To have a kingdom mindset, you have to realize that God's guiding you and involved in your every day. You've got to realize there is plenty of every good thing. We laugh because when I say, well, when Jesus got to the last ten, he said, I just ran out, heaven just ran out of anointing, we'll have to wait till tomorrow. We think that's funny, but the same anointing and finances and every good thing that is available in heaven is available to us. There, I'll tell you right now, there's enough forgiveness to go around. Some people think, I just there isn't enough mercy for me to forgive you. Yes, there is. You're just too stubborn to forgive. There's enough mercy. If we are having a kingdom mindset, we have forgiveness and healing on our mind. We're mercy-minded like Jesus was. If we have a kingdom mindset, we realize the rest of the world may be aware of the kingdom later. We are aware of the kingdom right now. This is our happy place. If you're visiting here, you come to an evening service. I cannot stay as late as you guys stay in fellowship. I just give you all keys and say, lock the door. And you say, why? Because they're having such a good time fellowshipping. They're, we love each other. This is our happy place. It's a, it's a manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth. Yeah. Revelation 11, 15 to 17 says that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom. There is coming a time when glorious light will flood this earth and the whole place will be part of the kingdom of God. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. We'll stop there. That's the day that we can hardly wait for. Won't that be a day? Yeah. No talking heads picking each other apart. You know what I mean? No politicians. God bless them all. No coronavirus. No hurt feelings with your husband or wife. That's the day. But in the meantime, if we're going to show this earth what God is all about, who he really is, in Luke 17, Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. So I couldn't get it all in, sorry. There's another scripture that says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. What does that mean? We're supposed to, you're supposed to use your faith to, to reach out and grab anything you need to have a great life and do your ministry, what God's called you to do. Whether it's finances, but you know, uh, isn't that good? I hope I helped you a little bit. Glory to God. God wants you available to where you, God, can demonstrate His kingdom through you. Not just His love, yes, His love, but also His healing power. Hallelujah. Yeah.